So as I said, like you know, this is actually now um, your time to you know to ask any questions. But just to give a little bit of context on obviously uh, customer experience, employee experience, and AI, I would like to um, invite uh, Annika and Perry as well to provide maybe a quick intro on their role, their business, and what um, you know this topic today uh, means to you, to your business. Annika, maybe if you can uh, kick off with that. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I guess I feel a little bit like the diversity candidate. Uh, not because I'm a woman, because I'm an HR person. I don't <laughs> imagine there's many HR people sitting in the room. Um, so as, um, as Ulrich so, so, so uh, nicely introduced, I'm the um, uh, global HR leader for what we call our core business at Uber. That's our Uber Eats um, and our ride sharing platform. Uh, so I lead a, a team of HR business partners around the world that supports that business. Um, for us, of course, um, the customer experience is, as a technology company and as a technology company in a relatively low margin, very, very competitive business, uh, that's an incredibly important concept for us. And when we think about customer, there's not really just one customer. Our drivers, our driver partners, um, our courier partners, as well as our riders and our eaters are all customers. Uh, engaging in, in different products on this platform of suite uh, that, that, that we now have at Uber. And if you think uh, particularly about ride sharing and the way that we interact with um, our driver partners, it's only through technology and their smartphone. And if you think about the complexity that they need to navigate um, on their tiny smartphone as they are driving through peak hour traffic across multiple lanes, to figure out where do they pick someone up from, uh, where do they actually stop in a, in a pickup point that is legal for them not to get um, a, a ticket to pick up a customer from, to figure out who is that the right dri rider that, that has just climbed into their vehicle, and then how to re-navigate that traffic and get back on the road. And all of that through a smartphone that they have to do while they're concentrating on the road. So the whole customer experience and, and, and the interaction um, and user interface in particular um, on that smartphone is just an incredibly important part of our business. Thank you, Annika. Perry, um, I know that um, you also recently announced at MediaCorp um, uh, a pretty significant partnership with YouTube, um, which I guess plays into your you know, customer experience uh, in our strategy as well. So could you provide a bit of background um, for MediaCorp and you know, what what these technologies mean to your business and strategy going forward? Sure. So, um, you know, one of the questions that often asked me is, so you are a commercial officer or a digital officer. What's the meaning of these two roles being put together? So I just wanted to give some context to that because I think it's meaningful from the perspective of the discussion that we are having today. You know, any digital transformation effort requires three things to come together. One is uh, technology, of course, which is the obvious one. The second is the technology has to be backed with a commercial or economic reality. If it is not, then sometimes technology tends to live in isolation or an island in a company. A lot of digital officers, technology officers face that. They, they, they wonder why isn't everybody on board with their suggestions or, or, or with their plans. And that's because it has to be backed with a commercial or an economic reality. And the third part, very important part, is HR. You have to have technology commercials or economics or HR, all three come together. And so the idea behind the role was to have a person who's running the business also look after a digital transformation because then you at least know what makes sense from a business perspective as well. So I thought that context is really important. Now from the, from the point of view of MediaCorp, now a little bit of background, you know, it's a, it's a public broadcaster here with commercial aspirations. Uh, we started off as a television company, radio company, a traditional broadcaster. And obviously, in this day and age, no company or you know, no traditional media company can think of itself as a print company or a TV company or a radio company because the patterns of media consumptions have changed dramatically. So it requires a mental shift for any media company to think of itself as a content producing company and which is platform agnostic. And that's what most of the media companies are going through. So if you take a global company like the New York Times, for instance, you would have seen that they are now making more money from subscription than from an advertising model. So the entire model, uh, whether it's Wall Street Journal, it's changing. So it becomes really important for us to do a lot of soul searching and, and not think of ourselves as a TV company or a radio company, but as a company that, uh, well, is in the business of news or telling stories, irrespective of the media. 
The medium is not important and let's not get too obsessed with a particular form of medium, which is where the entire YouTube conversation is important. If people are on YouTube, now it's our job, A, to make it technologically feasible to have our content on to YouTube and have back it up with the economic model. So the partnership with YouTube is about creating an economic model that makes it uh, relevant for YouTube to have our content and that also makes it viable for us to put our content on YouTube so that we can uh, earn our rightful share of uh, you know, money from that uh, content. Thank you, um, Perry, for the intro. Just quickly, if uh, any one of you has a question, if you could please just raise your um, hand. We've got a floating microphone going around because it, it will be recorded and part of the uh, video streaming afterwards as well. So please, um, if you could wait until the microphone um, arrives. But I might um, kick it off with um, a question towards Annika. Um, in, in Tim's presentation, I think uh, Manoj actually uh, you know, pointed out on that as well. It's a lot of companies experience with bots, first of all. And you know, bots, to some degree, you know, replace some you know, maybe internal employees and become representative for the companies. But there's a very fine line as well. Once you scale it up and have, um, you know, I think Tim mentioned, like up to 20 bots, um, you've, got, you've got to manage it. And the other, uh, I guess, challenge is that um, the data that you feed the bots will define what kind of engagement these bots um, are driving. So from your perspective as um, you know, HR leader, do you think AI or bots should come under technology, under the IT team, or do they, should they actually come under the HR team? Because they become essentially your representative and your employees to, to engage with, with, your, with your customer and your market. So I think a, a couple of thoughts. I think the first is that the way that uh, that, that I see we would get the best out of um, AI from an employee perspective and, and maybe even more generally is through the collaboration of our employees, um, our experts within HR with the, the intelligence, with the artificial intelligence that's provided by the bots. So it's, it's really that collaboration where you can, you can truly get the best, best value. It's not about replacing employees with a bot today. It's about augmenting um, the value, the intelligence that they're able to bring through mining different data um, or through some of the very complex uh, com com uh, complications that they can do, but adding to that the collaboration of a deep expert in whatever field that that might be. I think that also goes when, um, when you consider where, to your point, where they should be housed, how we should be developing them. Um, I, I think Manoj in his presentation talked about the collaboration across different parts of the organisation. Um, I, I think the boundaries of different teams and, uh, and the way that those teams come together within an organisation is blurring. Uh, we're not necessarily organised um, in companies in, in very siloed uh, teams uh, or different business functions today. We're really needing to start organised transversely um, around a, a particular business problem. And that could be HR people, IT people, finance people, business analysts, all coming together um, in order to solve the problem. So I don't think having um, a function that's sitting independently or siloed is going to be the way that you can deploy that technology in, in, the, in the right way. I think we need to be much more creative about how we can harness people uh, and people's skills and competence so that they can collaborate in, in the right way. It's actually interesting. So when, um, as part of the uh, preparation, um, th there's obviously a, a very a, a few popular cases where you know bots or you know um, AI tools became corrupt because of the data that was fed. And it's interesting that uh, people analyze you know the engagements of audiences with with AI tools or bots. And the third thing that people try is to break it, you know, to ask stupid questions like, "Do you want to marry me?" or something, to to just to see can they break it. So it's 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 a high risk that they get corrupted and you know and things. We've got one question. Um, can, have we got a microphone? Oh yeah, Chris. Sorry? Right. Oh, we need to, need to, need to um, borrow one. Yeah. Hi. Hi, I've got a question for Anika. Actually, two questions. The first one's on bots itself. You know, when will you start treating bots like employees? <laughs> Which means you onboard them, you have a job spec, they do something, you have a governance policy, they should not have biases. You know, things like that. What you expect out of employees so that tech people do not create bots in isolation which do jobs which may not prescribe to you know, the company's value structure, for example. So maybe there will be a time when <laughs> you might need to do that, and I think that time is approaching soon. But the second question, which probably is also connected, is uh, you talk about driver partners and the way you know, they interact with your system. 
and that's through a mobile phone. It's been the same for the last six years since I think Uber started. Nobody has reimagined that. But now's probably the time because in countries like Indonesia, where you've been just told that drivers cannot touch the mobile phone while they're driving. So now suddenly the innovation has been thrust on you, but has Uber done anything in the last six years in reimagining how driver partners can drive without being distracted and without having to touch the mobile phones? So let me take that one first, um, the second question. Um, so we actually don't operate in Indonesia anymore. Um, so um, that law will actually not impact uh, our driver partners. Um, <laughs> yes. A absolutely. So safety is uh, one of our four strategic priorities um, and a pillar that we spend an enormous amount of investment and, and R&D on. Uh, we have a massive tech um, practice, ma massive tech capability in the US where there's a, a, a number of teams looking at not just autonomous driving, um, but how we can use Internet of Things in a much more uh, uh, innovative way to, to support that, that driver experience with the end outcome actually be to drive, to drive safety, right? We want to have the minimum number of interactions where people have to swipe on a phone or actually click something and take their eyes off the road. So, you know, that's, we haven't solved it completely yet. Um, and at the end of the day, autonomous vehicle is, is another way that we will add to that suite of products um, and get to a safer outcome. To your earlier question, that's a really interesting um, point. I hadn't actually thought about when maybe some of my um, panelists up here might have a, a point of view. The, the one thing I would say though is that it, it does highlight um, something that I think is a broader issue across technology, which is we don't have the structures or the regulation or the, the, the regulatory context in, in many places in place today to support the kind of advancements that we're having. So the idea that we might need to regulate in some way through some kind of contract um, with, um, with a bot, I think the real question is, you know, when are we actually going to modernize and ensure that our regulatory frameworks, uh, the relationships that we have between employees, employers and technology actually are current and relevant for how we're using that technology today? I'm not sure if Tim, you want to add something, otherwise we've yeah. got another question. Yeah, just uh, very quickly on that, um, you know, uh, managing the bots, uh, there's a, a couple of organisations, if you look at Spark in New Zealand, they're actually one of the, probably the global leaders in, in this space, and um, there's another organisation in the US who, I can't remember who it is at the moment, but they'll come to me, that um, they treat their bots like employees, right? There, there are training budgets for a bot. You know, the, employee, the, the bots are charged out like contractors. Right? There's an hourly rate or a per transaction rate, um, you know, there is a, so there's an understanding that, okay, we have training budgets for the business, we need to train the bots too. Um, okay, the training's different, right? It's, it's not, you don't sit through a course, etc. in the same way, but we need budgets to be able to do this properly, right? We, we have an understanding of how long, you know, where this bot might reside, um, you know, what, what hours this bot works even. I know people who, you know, their bots work between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., for example, because that's when they're supported by IT or, you know, et cetera. So they're putting that same structure around the bots than, and the AI that you have around humans um, in, in the business. And they're taking a lot of learnings from their HR or their employee experience team um, to make sure that uh, they are treating them the same way. And the, the bias piece is an interesting one. I'm not sure anyone's actually solved that one yet, how to sort of take the, the existing human biases out of these bots. Um, that's a, a topic perhaps for, <laughs> for, for a deeper discussion. And Paul, I think there was one question. Um, okay. Hi, sorry. Okay. Manoj and Tim, great insights in your presentations. Thank you for that. My question is to Tim. Uh, you had mentioned that organizations are taking one of two approaches to AI, um, either going with the cloud vendors or if they are with the others, like SAP, Oracle, and Salesforce, you had said they're looking to make their apps more intelligent. Um, my question is, as customers are imagining and you know, envisioning this digital journey, who are they leaning into to you know, help them through that process? Is it the system integrators? Is it the vendors that are already within their organizations? Or are there consulting firms that, they, I mean, apart from analysts like yourself, of course, who are probably in conversation with them? So who, 
who are they biased towards helping them through this? I would well, maybe pass this question on to Perry as well, so you might maybe share your experience as well within Media Corp. Yeah. Well, look, it's mainly me, but um, when they don't get that time. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think the answer is all of the above, well, is the reality. Um, you know, uh, people are definitely going to the Accentures and the um, IBMs and the Wipros and Infosys of the world, um, you know, for, for some of their strategy. and. Um, I guess I'd probably argue that maybe Accenture, Deloitte, are the ones that are, um, maybe PwC perhaps are, are doing particularly well in that space at the moment. Um, but we've also got this massive startup community both in Singapore and you know, you know, a small AI startup community in Singapore, a massive one in China, a few in Australia, you know, New Zealand, et cetera, across, across the region, Indonesia, et cetera. And um, you know, they're driving a lot of discussions too. So it is some of the technology provides themselves. Um, I, I guess I'd probably argue that um, a, a couple of organisations haven't gone as hard on their AI messaging as perhaps they should have. Um, yours is actually one of the Microsoft's one that, that has some fantastic AI assets that we just don't hear about as much. And I, I see some Microsoft clients going to AWS or something like this for something that Microsoft themselves provide. So um, I, you know, I think we all have to take a bit of a responsibility for educating our own clients, letting them know what's possible right, is, is a big piece, and also making it really easy to use. Right, so one of the big th things I didn't talk about in the presentation, I said that we're probably going to be hiring data scientists and all these new roles, right? I see that as a relatively short to medium term thing, as the AI actually gets easy to use, right? That a normal business user can train a model themselves. They're told what data to get. They can train a model, create a new one, without bringing in a data scientist to do that. Well, data scientists will always be used by the bleeding edge businesses. But I see AI is going to get much more consumable for a lot of businesses, right? Um, and so, and it is, that's happening today. The big four cloud platforms, that's probably the biggest trend in those cloud pl platforms today, right? Um, so, but letting our customers know about that is, is, a, is a big part of it that um, we're probably not doing as good a job as we could have because uh, AI this year compared to last year is probably twice as easy. Perry, if you want to, from your internal research. Yeah, I agree with Tim. I'll just add one more thing, which is um, uh, we look for whether it's vendors or technology providers or system integrators who understand the context of the business. That's really important. We, we recently, I'll give you an example. We recently held a three-day workshop where we invited uh, anyone who's working in the field of AI to present to us what kind of solutions would they have for a media company. Uh, the company that impressed us the most was actually not a, a, a big firm, but this is the company that took the pains to understand the context of the business and apply the AI modules in the context of a media company. And, th and that's really important. Uh, I'll give you a very specific example. Um, let's look at a speech-to-text uh, uh, translation, for instance. Uh, the, the context of where it's being used becomes really important. Now, speech to text or, you know, is, is great in a conversation. Let's take a Google Translate. It can be 95% accurate and it's fine. In fact, the 5% inaccuracy leads to some nice humorous situations which we can live with. But in the context of news, that 5% distortion is, you know, you, you can't live with that, right? It has to be 100% accurate. So the context of the business completely changes and a company and any, whether it's a vendor or an integrator who understands the context in which it has to be used and applied is the one that we look for uh, when we are thinking of AI uh, and how to implement it in our business. Yeah. And Paul, I know you had a, a question. Um, Hi, Paul Harris from Anaplan. Uh, it's fascinating to hear the insights there about the possibilities for AI, and I think it's uh, something really that's going to hugely disrupt the industry. But how does the industry protect itself, this is a question for all the panel, against the more nefarious uses of, of AI, and particularly the proliferation of uh, fake news? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's something that we, we think deeply about. It's, it's an important area for us. and. Uh, uh, you know, one of the things that we are looking at, uh, you know, uh, towards AI is to crowdsource news, for instance. It's a huge area for us. We are thinking deeply about it. But along with crowdsourcing become, uh, come two problems. One is, how do you present all this data? You know, the moment you open something for crowdsourcing, you have so much noise. How do you take out the signal from the noise? And then how do you detect fake news from, uh, from real? Uh, and, that, and, that's, and firstly, nobody has the answer. 
you know, we've consulted pretty much all the big vendors, everybody from the large search engines to social, social platforms to media companies like us are still trying to find the perfect answer. But uh, what, what's really important is to use AI with human effort, at least at this stage. We do use uh, AI to figure out what's breaking news, uh, which news uh, item or, or, or news uh, will, will spread faster than the others, but there's always that last curative human element there we are having to employ to finally put it out there. So when we talk to our reporters and tell them, hey, these are the 100 pieces of news that are floating out, uh, we think this one will be the breakout news item, so work on this. There's always this editorial human aspect to it. But we do apply AI uh, at a fundamental level because there's just so much data that without, uh, it cannot be done. It's humanly not possible. So I guess it's a combination of both. We, we are hoping that we can make it completely dependent on AI uh, you know, sometime in the near future. But as of now, I think it's a combination of both. Um, there's actually a few more questions. Um, there's one uh, for Mervyn, I think Koshik as well, and Nick wanted to ask one as well. I know we are um, you know, running a little bit behind, but we, we just maybe just continue. I know that some of you may have to go for, for other meetings, but otherwise we just let it go and uh, let it running for another, another 10 minutes or so. So Mervyn, do you want to? Okay, um, well this question should be for Manoj. I think it's uh, most of the panel people are in speaking and it's not in speaking. <laughs> no need, you know, it's okay. <laughs> Don't put but, me uh, in a practical situation. But maybe a first comment to Tim. I think uh, what you mentioned that NEC has one of the better feature recognition is correct. <laughs> and why it's not being sold so much is because NEC has not been very good in telling people. And that's also correct. I concur agree with you because I am from NEC. <laughs> so now the question for Manoj is, uh, is customer experience really the means to the end or is it the end? Um, in the government, I mean, I've been dealing with lots of government uh, when they do the AI, they really can't really find the true ROI, return of investment. Like, would it be less people? And if it's less people, what would the jobs be like for the those people who are made redundant, for example? So these are the things that uh, has been bogging the top level management. It doesn't bog the lower level because the lower level people, when they rise up, they want to show their presence as very modern and very technology savvy and AI. So they've been going around making lots of very beautiful statements and everything, trying to get the management attention. But the management attention, when they come up to the overall organization structure and all the maintenance and all the other stuff, it comes to a point as what is the real return on investment? So have you got any advice for people like the government and customers who are looking into AI? Yeah. Uh, so you know, clearly, you know, we, we are, we, we call it different ter terminologies, you know. A few years ago, we called it uh, uh, a different technology. You know, let's say speech, rec IVR. You know? Today we call it AI. So th this progression of technologies and the conversations around automation, displacing jobs is not gonna go away anywhere. Right? And it is, the, it is the biggest challenge that companies face. How do we stay relevant? Uh, so the answer is, I don't think we have a choice to say, we cannot adopt technology because technology like AI helps us uh, you know, push the boundaries of things and problems that we can solve in a more efficient way. Yeah? So the only option we have is to embrace it and embrace it with all ferocity. Uh, so uh, my answer to it is you know, we got to acknowledge it and rather work with it rather than deflect it because there's no other uh, alternative to it. You know? so I, she, I, Tim, I, I, yeah? I have a really quick response to that. Um, with AI business cases, I tell people, you don't think AI. Right? Don't ever start with AI. Right? You're trying to solve a business problem or a customer problem. And where AI is useful is you ask some questions. Um, will making it talk or making it personalise or making it move or you know, the, the things that AI do, making it interact, will that help the customer experience, help solve the business problem? If any of those things that AI does helps to solve the business problem, then you can use AI to, to solve that problem, right? But um, one of the things I, I caution people of is don't go into this thinking AI is going to solve every problem, right? There's going to be some simple automation. There's going to be some things that don't use AI at all. Maybe it's just a new interface or a new way of doing things in the business or a new culture in the business, or et cetera, right, that's going to solve that problem. But it's the, these questions you ask around what AI helps you do differently if that helps it, then yes, 
absolutely explore that opportunity uh, for AI. That's when you should uh, be, be thinking about it. But don't think about AI as, as the outcome. We've got one question here for Nick, and then Koshik, I think, uh, first, next. Hi, thanks. Um, Tim, question for you. In, in the research that you were talking about earlier, what I didn't see was professional services. Um, and I'd be interested to hear what, if anything, you're seeing in professional services in terms of take up of, of some of the technologies you're talking of. Obviously, the robotics is probably less relevant for professional services, but the, the others where you're moving into machine learning and deep learning and other things like that, are you seeing any take up in professional services? I'm, I'm a lawyer, so. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, so sorry. this is professional services firms using yes, AI. Exactly. Yeah. Um, as a, <laughs> As a general, they, they are much less mature. Like the, like when you look at the guy, it, professional service comes under our business services category, uh, basically. And you saw that most of them business services was was pretty low. Um, as I, you know, I, I made the point already that uh, you know the IT services providers in there are absolutely doing it and using it. Um, and we've even seen headcounts at Infosys and Wipro, etc., actually been coming down over a few years because of the massive investments they're making in automation. Um, Look, there are certainly some great case studies of organisations, legal firms using it um, for discovery work, etc. But um, they are the exception rather than the rule at, at this stage. Um, and and, and you, you'd probably argue this around any new technology that they generally don't embrace, professionals don't typically embrace new technologies quickly, right? They sort of wait for it to be packaged up for them. The other thing about professional services is why they're a, a hard market to penetrate for AI is, you know, you look at legal firms in Singapore and accounting firms in Australia, etc. they're all using these tiny little localised packages, these companies that have, you know, 20 to 200 clients perhaps, um, you know, software that's written in someone's bedroom, um, not sort of produced at a um, massive scale. And that software is only going to get smart when that person makes that software smart. Right, and then when the company chooses to upgrade that system if it's not cloud-based, so so that typically significantly delays that uptake in the professional services space, just because traditional most professional services don't use the big SAPs and the stuff that's automatically getting smart as part of the the standard upgrade cycles. Yeah, maybe you know another way to look at it: while professional services may be slower in adopting it, but the large banks, for example, you know, like J.P. Morgan, in their legal team they have a chief IT and innovation officer just for the legal team because they see the enormous potential to automate, use AI to simplify all the contractual transactions. So they are developing now technology themselves because they see they are the big spenders and user of these services. So we may see some spin-offs from there eventually coming and impacting the broader industry. <laughs> yeah, so, sorry, Anik, Anik. Yeah, I was just thinking about linking actually the last two questions. I think um, one of the things that, that is obvious is that technology and automation and, and AI w will start to encroach upon some of maybe the more entry level jobs that we see in many professions. And what that means is we need to rethink and companies need to rethink you know, what are entry level positions and if you take it a step back, what are the skills that we need to be growing in people um, through our education so they are able to enter the workforce because the way that we've done so traditionally is now being hollowed out. And so I think when you think about the ROA from a government perspective and then how an organisation needs to think about how they use the technology, it's that again where you need to be collaborating to make sure that the next generation is, is going to be graduating with skills that will enable them to enter the workforce. Because the jobs will be there, they'll just be different jobs than what they may have been in the past. <laughs> or a software engineer. Just conscious of time, so we've got two more questions here and then afterwards we maybe conclude the official part where we can still continue in a small group to, con to um, continue the discussion. Yeah, thank Check. you. So my question is for uh, Manoj and Tim. Um, Manoj, you talked about democratization of IT and business symphony, I like that word. Um, so, and also, of course, we've been talking about collaboration with business. But Tim, in one of the service slides that you put up, uh, which talked about AI decision making, 
we saw that it's very heavily skewed towards IT and probably senior management and kind of drop sharply when it comes to involving other parts of the business. So do you explain it in terms of uh, AI being in very early stages of adoption? So the, it's kind of POCs and skunk work going on in pockets rather than getting the business involved and hence getting a full, you know, kind of framework of business case uh, um, from an enterprise uh, point of view? Yeah. Um, so what, one of the data points I didn't put up is, a, is the funding one, who's funding it, and it's interesting how much funding is coming from the innovation team and the R&D team. And that sort of says where it is today, right? That it's, uh, these are, you know, sort of out there ideas that we're trying to fund to see if they make any difference to our business. I think that sort of shows, in, in a lot of respects, where the maturity is today. Um, that will certainly change over time as, um, as AI just becomes part of what you do. And um, as Annika was mentioning this idea that, you know, we're solving business problems, we're just going to bring the right people together in the business to solve that and met some or all of those people will have some sort of AI skills or knowledge uh, to be able to help to do that as, as these new skills proliferate across the business too. Yeah, no, I think we are still in day zero. So uh, business owners still don't understand what AI is, the implications of AI. Uh, we refer to bots as AI because, you know, and the earlier question, bots is just the conversational element of AI, but uh, where do you put working hours for all the work that happens at the back end? I don't think you can do that. So this is just the understanding that we have as of today. Uh, the sooner the business owners understand, the better it is. Also, going back to one of the earlier questions, and it was Susan, I think, who asked the question, how do organizations pick up on this? How do we integrate it faster? Which is the best source of knowledge and you know, gain? I think acquisition is the best way to do it. And you see that all the big companies, if they are acquiring constantly, they acquire these technologies and integrate it. That seems to be the easiest way to do it as compared to, let's say, working with the larger professional services firms today because they are still playing catch up in many aspects. The startup ecosystem is innovating at a much more frantic pace. So that is an easier way to access this innovation uh, through these acquisitions. And the world's biggest companies demonstrate that by being on an acquisition spree 365 days a year uh, just to you know, stay relevant. So we've got one final question, I think, here on the front table as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm JP from Vodafone, and uh, I'll keep this quick in the interest of time. Um, you know, from the, techno from the telecom experience, we've always seen regulators in various countries actually a step behind. The companies go ahead, make investments, they, they put in their operating models, and they go ahead. And then we have the regulator coming from the behind, as I call it. And then there is an, an element which slows you down. You've already committed your investments, and then you need to rejig your operating models. In all the AI discussions and researches, I just leave this question to the panel. Anybody wants to pick it up. Where do we see the role of regulator? Is it going to be a repeat of telecom? Any volunteers to take <laughs> this question? <laughs> well, who is the regulator? <laughs> because you know, who will be the regulator to regulate AI? <laughs> so, you know, we work very closely with um, uh, various government bodies and, and there's no single one. Uh, you have an IMDA, you have the ministry, and I think at least in Singapore, we are really blessed that we have uh, uh, regulators or government or decision makers who really understand the power of, the transformative power of AI and are the ones who are actually encouraging us to use AI because they understand that if we do not use this, the mediums that we have, whether it's a broadcasting medium like MediaCorp or other industries, will become irrelevant. The business models will not be able to survive beyond, you know, beyond a few years if they do not deploy AI. So on our side, actually, uh, because we work closely with them, we think we're in a good space here. What you're saying is absolutely relevant at a global scale. But, but we, we do not, fortunately, we don't face that problem. In fact, we will collaborate very closely with the government to see how, because AI needs scale, and it needs collaboration across different players, and no one company can deploy these models. So we leverage on the government's uh, consensus-making abilities to see how we can partner with other players to deploy some AI models. So we are in a good space here, at least in Singapore. Maybe, Nick, there's your opportunity for the legal industry. Um, 
there might be some disputes coming up. Um, so I think with that, I would, I don't, Amit. Sorry, I know we're uh, <laughs> running a bit short. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't help just make a couple of observations and a couple of questions, actually for Perry. Um, so two things, I'll, I'll say it all together. One is, um, we know that one of the first few industries to get disrupted was media. Yeah? And, and you know, there's three stages of disruption, already disrupted, getting disrupted, and will be disrupted, the ones who haven't woken up yet. But what was interesting was, when I spoke with you about six months ago, you talked about, we, we showed that clipping, and you talked about AI and use of ML for customer experience, right? And then, if you looked at Tim's slides, um, the one industry that's using ML the most at the moment is media and telco, yeah? So first of all, so, so two parts to my question. So first of all, just wanted some thoughts from you on that, just to close off. Second, Manoj talked about business symphony. I mean, your title's always fascinated me, chief commercial and digital officer. Yeah, commercial facing the market, digital making things happen. Do you think that's the forced way of driving business symphony? And is that, is that, is that the way forward? Yeah. So, uh, so Amit, I'll just broaden your question to, uh, to how we are thinking about digital uh, transformation, machine learning, and how do we apply it to different parts of our business. So over the last year or so, we, we would, at least at MediaCorp, have, tr have tried to look at all our businesses through a three-lensed model. Uh, we call it ACE. I think we talked about it when you met last. Uh, a stands for algorithms, C for communities, and E for engagement. And if you look at some of the announcements we've made over the last few months, you'll see some elements of each of these uh, algorithms, uh, you know, everything. We look at all our businesses, whether it's news, whether it's Toggle, which is a OTT platform, as to how are we leveraging the power of algorithms to, uh, to transform the business. In our news world, we, uh, you know, there's a very interesting term we often use. It's called the Trump versus economist uh, test. Uh, so the dile dilemma a news organization faces is we know that whatever Trump says about the wall or whatever, 80% of people in every country would love to hear about it, so you can put it right up there on the headlines. But let's say an economist in Indonesia or India comes up with something really interesting. We know that only 5% of our readers in different countries would be interested in it, but which are those 5%? How do we surface that news to them? It's humanly not possible to uh, figure that out. So how do we use algorithms to uh, do this Trump versus uh, economist paradox. So are we using algorithms? That's number one. Number two is the power of communities. If as a, as a news organization or any, I mean, Uber knows this very well, you need to use the power of communities and co-creation. So we are very actively looking at it. No longer can any organization believe that it has all the talent in the world uh, to create uh, you know, a viable business. The number of people who are talented will always be higher outside of your organization. So we are coming up with crowdsourcing models for news aggregation, for entertainment, and so on. And the third part is engagement. The rules for customer engagement are completely changing, which is why we are looking at companies like YouTube. Till two years back, YouTube was competition. Now they are partners. Because if engagement is happening on YouTube, we better figure out how to use power of engagement through YouTube through this. So uh, I think machine learning, it's a relevant question, is one part of it. But all businesses need to look at digital transformation from this lens. Coming to your question about forced confluence of commercial and digital interest, I think it's one of the ways. But uh, it's really important for, uh, in our company, every Monday, all C-level come together and discuss various projects and drive consensus on the project. This is absolutely important. We spend the first half of all Mondays with all C-levels just discussing what's happening in their world. And everything is done by consensus. That's super important. So yes, you can uh, have one person driving commercial and digital. Yes, that's one way to do this. But there are various other ways to do it. The most important thing is communication. Is communication happening or not? And are you creating the right platform for communication? Thank you, um, Perry. So I think with that, uh, first of all, I want to apologize for running slightly late. It was for my one drop today to keep the time, which I obviously <laughs> missed. Um, I also want to thank um, Annika and Perry again for you know, taking the time and you know, kind of um, being part of the panel and sharing their experience, thoughts, and um, you know, strategies. And also Manoj and um, uh, Tim for, for, for sharing some of the ecosystem research and uh, you know, uh, some, some of their so thoughts and vision on the topic. And with that, I would like to conclude the um, you know, official part. I think neither of us has to vacate the room um, or have to leave immediately. So if you want to stick around and ask some one-on-one -on -one questions, you know, please, please do that. Um, I would also um, 
obviously like, like you for your time, but um, invite you to one of our upcoming sessions, which will be likely in April on cybersecurity. We are just about to conclude a very significant study um, across a thousand organizations in, uh, in, in Asia Pacific on cybersecurity privacy, which is very relevant to this topic as well. So we haven't confirmed a date yet, but at some stage in April we will um, do a similar session. And um, also one thing to highlight is, as we said, like, you know, these studies or this research that you've seen is not concluded. It's ongoing and live. So um, the data will, will be, um, uh, we're getting new data points coming in as we speak through our digital platform. So that's why um, we see it more like a, you know, a, a point in time conversation, but it would be good to maybe do that again or continue this conversation over the next few months and see how the trend is shaping out, especially in AI and CX and EX, where we're still at a, at a very early stage of the, of the roadmap, I guess. So with that, um, thank you very much. And um, you know, hope you have a productive day and I hope it was useful um, a morning for you. Thank you.